Hi, church. Very good evening to each one of you. We have come to the final lesson, lesson 71. I think we should just close our eyes for a moment first. Father, we want to thank you that you have enabled us and caused us, Father God, to finish what you have started with us, the elects at NCCKL. That we know it's all about you, God. It's your empowerment, Father. And you have carried us through, God. We want to thank you for seeing us through. And we know, Father, you have put so much into our hearts over this period. And we give you all glory and honor for the book of Acts, Father. We want to thank you and bless you. In Jesus' name, we ask. And the church will say with me, Amen. Wow, two years, church. That's pretty long, right? Very enduring. Wow. I can't believe it. I remember when we got started, I just came out of my health issue a couple of months later. And uh, I was, in fact, advised to rest and save my strength so that I can be effective on Sundays. But I persisted. The Lord told me to do it. And I knew it's going to be a long haul. And I said, yes, Lord, I will do it. And the Lord has carried me through. It is the Lord's grace that has enabled me to finish what he started. Some of you are wondering, I can't even remember, Pastor, what you did last week. Yeah, it is true. Sometimes even at school, when in the primary, or even in the secondary, or in the tertiary level, when we go to work, we can't remember what we learned. Is it a waste, church? Not at all. During that period, we are actually being developed so that we'll have a clearer mind that it will be formed to understand things tangible and intangible. So when you're in the working class, it might not relate to what you studied, but it has developed you to a place where your capacity to grasp, to understand facts and matters becomes greater. In a similar fashion, even in the spiritual life, you may not remember everything that was taught over these two years. But let me say this to you. Most of you in this church who have followed through obediently, which most of you have, you have developed a very sound mind to uphold the doctrines of the scripture. Today I can say it with confidence. Our church is very balanced. Most of you are well groomed in the things of God. Your capacity to understand the Bible has become greater when you really sit and analyze it. This is what it will do for you. You can't really remember every lesson. Those of you who have taken notes, maybe you can refresh yourself when you go back to those notes. But most of us, we could have forgotten all of it. But let me say, the spirit man has been so beautifully cultivated and developed so that you may understand and discern the word of God more effectively. So it's a success story, church. God has been faithful. And all of you have followed through. You have grown leaps and bounds so that now you're able to be very strong in the fundamentals in our Christian faith. We give all glory and honor to God for carrying us through. But today, church, we have come to the final lesson. And I've entitled it as The Accomplishment. The book of Acts is a story of all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day that you are taken up to heaven. We find this in chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. Let me read it to you. The former account I made, O oh, dear fellows, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. The work that Jesus began was to be completed by his disciples who were to be his witnesses. This is taken from Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When we come to the end of book of Acts, Luke leaves us with the Apostle Paul preaching the gospel in the capital of the empire, which is Rome. 
And it seems like the way it just ended, Paul had the liberty with all openness, unhindered to preach the gospel of God's righteousness for at least two years that he was there. And so in one sense, the mission was accomplished in that sense, with the gospel going to the remotest part of the earth. And yet in another sense, Luke leaves the story open and ongoing. Jesus' followers have been carrying on the mission for almost 2,000 years, but it's not yet thoroughly accomplished. We know that one day in heaven, there will be some from every tribe and tongue and people and nations whom Jesus purchased by his very own blood through his baptism, death and resurrection. This is found in Revelation 5 verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. There have been encouraging advances in the recent years, church. This gospel of God's righteousness, which was eaten for a moment of time, is now being preached once again by the elects in these last days. And the early disciples over the years at least during the apostolic age, they preached the gospel of God's righteousness that constitutes Jesus' baptism, death, and resurrection. But then for many, many centuries, this gospel was literally overshadowed by many other so-called gospels, which has literally removed the component of the baptism, which is an indispensable component that fulfills God's righteousness. But thanks be to God in these last days, at least for the last 30 years, we have, by the endeavors of Pastor Paul C. Jong and the NLM ministry, we do see that this gospel is once again being reinvigorated and is reverberating the entire world today. This gospel has gone far. And we are the recipients as well, church, at NCC Kel, we have the true gospel that was preached by the apostles and the disciples. God has handpicked us as a church so that we can continue the work that He started. In these last days, we will bring it to completion. And we are to carry this mandate to fulfill the great commission that the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded all His elects to carry out in their lifetime. There are still so many who have not heard the gospel of God's righteousness. And it's so sad that many of them die without knowing this gospel. Though they lived in a church life, hearing all sorts of preaching over the years, but unfortunately, without the baptism, the death becomes meaningless to every person. In our church, we have the whole gospel, the gospel of God's righteousness that the apostles preached. We have the privilege of joining the Lord in accomplishing His purposes of being glorified among all nations, as Revelation 5, 9 says. In that sense, the book of Acts is still being written. So we are part of that. We are carrying out the unfinished work until Christ comes back for the second time to take us back home. Acts 28, the final chapter, shows us how God accomplishes His mission. These verses show that Christianity is here to stay for divine care and blessing. This evening, church, I've got only two points for you. And as usual, my points will have sub-points as well. Okay? So, two points. Point number one, church. How God accomplishes. In fact, I intended to read the whole chapter, which I'm going to do it. But I'm going to break it down to two parts. Point one and point two. So, in point one, I'm going to read to you Acts 28, 
verses 1 to 16. Verse 1. Now, when they had escaped, they then found out that the island was called Malta. And the natives showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and made us all welcome because of the rain that was falling and because of the cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a wiper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. Verse 4. So when the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he has escaped the sea, yet justice does not allow to live. But he shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. However, they were expecting that he would swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had looked for a long time and saw no arm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Verse 7. In that region, there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went into him and prayed, and he laid his hand on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. They also honored us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. Verse 11. After three months, we sailed in an Alexandrian ship whose figurehead was the twin brothers, which had wintered at the island. And landing at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, we circled around and reached Regium. And after one day, the south wind blew, and the next day we came to Puteoli, where we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. Verse 15. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Appii Forum and three inns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. Verse 16. Now when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was permitted to dwell by himself with the soldier who guarded him. God bless his word. Now, once again, let me repeat to you. Point number one, how God accomplishes. God accomplishes his great commission by protecting, providing for, and empowering his servants. Paul and his fellow shipmates discovered that they were shipwrecked on Malta, a small island located at the south of Sicily. It was cold and rainy, and the men were wet from swimming ashore. The natives showed them extraordinary kindness by kindling a bonfire and eventually helping the men find lodging for the winter. This was a show us God's protection, provision, and power. Let's start off with protection. God accomplishes His great commission by protecting His servants. We see in this story that Paul didn't see himself above helping out in the mundane task. A man of his stature, the apostle, and allowed himself to be used even to do mundane things. And as we look into the story, as he was collecting sticks for the fire, perhaps due to his poor eyesight, that among the sticks was a wiper. The warmth of the fire caused, you know, I think somehow the wiper was stiff from the cold. It loosened up and it fastened on Paul's end. Paul calmly shook it off into the fire. The natives concluded that Paul must be a murderer and that even 
though he escaped from the sea, in their mind they thought that justice had not allowed him to live. They waited and watched for him to die. Particularly when you are bitten by the snake, you swell up and they are expecting him to fall down and die. But when they saw nothing had happened, they changed their minds and concluded that he was a god. This is very common with unbelievers. They must see something. And this is something, they assume it, and immediately, even a devil can become God. And this is exactly what's happening here. Clearly, the natives on Malta had witnessed the effects of such poisonous snakes before. I believe that many could have been bitten before and they could have died. So they are expecting Paul to die as well. Luke tells this story to show how God miraculously protected Paul because God's purpose was that Paul would bear witness in Rome. I'm going to quote you a verse from Acts 23 verse 11, which I've quoted so often over the weeks. But it's very, very pivotal because it sets the pace. And in this verse, let me read it to you. But the following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Very powerful portion of scripture. And nothing, whether shipwreck or poisonous sick, can thwart God's purpose for his servants until the work is done. Paul need to bear witness for Jesus in Rome. So nothing is going to happen to him until then. After the winter, the shipwrecked man set sail for Rome on another ship. Here Luke includes another detail. That maybe you're wondering why Luke is writing about this, the name of the ship, the figure eight and so forth. But it's got a reason as well. And it is an interesting fact. A int as something more. The ship had been named for its figurehead, the twin brothers. Verse 11, we find this, which refers to Castor and Pollux, whom the mystical god, Zeus, supposedly transformed into gods represented by the constellation of the horoscope we call Gemini. Sailors considered, even today, there are so many big ships called twin head, because somehow these unbelieving hearts they considered them as a sign of good luck in a storm. Luke felt the need to mention it and to give these details to contrast pagan superstitions with the true protection that believers have only through God and God alone. It's God's protection, church. The reason for their safe voyage from Malta to Rome was not the mystical twin brothers, but rather the protection of the living God. That's about protection. Let me just move on to another aspect, provision. God accomplishes a great commission by providing for his servants. Yes, he protects them, but he also provides for them as well. God provided for his servants through the unusual hospitality of the natives on Malta. Publius, the leading man of the island, entertained all 276 men for three days, and then he apparently found them lodging for the winter as well. As the men departed, the islanders honoured them with many gifts and supplies that was necessary for their trip. It's found in verse 10. They also honoured us in many ways, and when we departed, they provided such things as were necessary. God also provided for Paul through a week of fellowship with the brethren, the believers, in Puteoli. It's about 140 miles from Rome. And more so, the centurion was kind to allow Paul to visit those saints. God further provided refreshing moments for Paul to the elects who came out as far as the market of Appius. In the scripture, it says Appii. And of course, notwithstanding the three inns or we call it the three tavens in some translation, to escort Paul into the city. Can you imagine, church, what the rest of the travelers in Paul's company thought 
when they saw these people welcoming the prisoners as an important dignitaries, many came. I believe the 276, many became believers. And when these visitors who came to refresh Paul, Aretychus, and Luke, they also entertained the prisoners. Some of them had become believers. Paul thanked God and took courage when he saw all these elects whom he had longed to see for several years, everything coming to a fruition. He says this in Romans 15 verse 23, how God had refreshed him. God also provided for Paul by permitting him to stay by himself. A generous gift of the Philippian church was brought to him. Paul's financial needs were met. I want you to know, church, that Paul's case is not unique. We have heard enough stories of how God had met the needs of his servants who truly have given themselves over to serve the Great Commission. God always meets our personal and financial needs. He never fails because He's faithful. I've experienced myself. When I started to serve God all these years, serve the gospel of God's righteousness, He has never failed me to personally care for me and everything that matters to me. Even financially, God has provided enough and I'm very satisfied with Him because He's faithful to His servants when we do the work of God. Another aspect that I see, church, not only He protects and provides, and more than that, He gives us the power. Acts 28, verse 8 to 9, the scripture says, And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went in to him and prayed, and he laid his hand on him and healed him. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. What do you see from this church? God accomplishes His great commission by empowering His servants. Although Luke was the physician, a doctor, the Lord used Paul to heal miraculously. Many of the sick people in Malta of course, first was the father of Publius, then many more. They all were healed. They begin to see God's power at work right before them through this servant of God because God empowered Paul. And I believe that probably this gave Paul and his companions more opportunities to tell the people in Malta about Christ. God seems to grant miracles to a greater degree on the frontiers of the gospel truth where people need powerful authentication of its truthfulness. You find that even in the book of Acts, when you go to the remotest part of the world or when you are preaching to somebody and you are very faithful in what you are doing, God will accompany it. Not necessarily physical, sometimes spiritual, supernatural act of God which will be evident because God wants to authenticate what we preach. He's with us, church. He said it. I will be with you, lo, till the ends of the ages. And he participates and gets himself involved in all that we do when we carry the great commission to the world around us. God accomplishes his great commission by protecting, providing, and empowering his servants. Point number two, mission accomplished. God accomplishes His great commission through His servants who obediently proclaim the gospel to all people. I'm going to read to you Acts 28, verses 17 to the last verse in the book of Acts. And it came to pass after three days that Paul called the leaders of the Jews together. So when they had come together, he said to them, Men and brethren, though I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Verse 18. 
who, when they had examined me, wanted to let me go, because there was no cause for putting me to death. But when the Jews spoke against it, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not that I had anything of which to accuse my nation. For this reason, therefore, I have called for you, to see you and speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Verse 21. Then they said to him, We neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren who came reported or spoken any evil of you. But we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. Verse 23. When they had appointed him a day, many came to him at his lodging, to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets, from morning till evening. And when some were persuaded by things which were spoken, and some disbelieved. Verse 25. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to these people and say, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of these people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Verse 28, Therefore let it be known to you that the salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him. The last verse of the book of Acts, verse 31, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. God bless his word. I just want to give you two aspects of how God's mission is accomplished, namely the servants. God accomplishes his mission by his servants. It seems odd that Luke never reports that Paul preached the gospel on Malta. I don't know why. If you read the whole passage, no mention at all. Nor does he report any conversion. Luke is more interested in pressing quickly towards his conclusion in Rome. Paul could not be silent, I believe, for three months in Malta. When Paul finally got to Rome, Paul quickly summoned the Jewish leaders to explain why he was a prisoner there. It seems strange that they had not heard anything about Paul and their knowledge of Christianity. This we find in Acts 28 verse 22. But we desire to hear from you what you think. For concerning this sect, we know that it is spoken against everywhere. Paul spent the entire day testifying about the kingdom of God, which refers not only to Christ's future reign on earth, but also to the gospel of God's righteousness that brings us, or the believers, under his rule. Paul was persuading them concerning Jesus, and they had a lot of interaction, I believe, debating and discussing. I believe God used Paul to enlighten them about the promises that God has made about his son Jesus, the Messiah. I believe Paul has also spoken about the authority that's found in the law and the prophets, which is in the Old Testament. He may have spoken about the sacrificial system, the shadow of the laying of hands, the important role that the last prophet, John the Baptist, played. I believe he spoke about the death and the resurrection as well. And most importantly, he speaks to us about Isaiah 53, the panoramic description of how Christ was bruised and 
stricken and smitten and crucified on the cross. I believe he did all these things. The outcome was, as in many of Paul's previous experiences, some were persuaded, but others would not believe. And there was a dispute between the two groups. It's fine in verse 25. So when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul as said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah, the prophet, to our fathers. Before Paul left, Paul gave them his parting shot, quoting Isaiah 6, verses 9 to 10. I read to you earlier, but I feel like I need to read to you again. Verse 9, And he said, Go and tell these people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of these people dull, and their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return and be healed. Basically, Paul is warning the Jews of the hardness of their hearts, which has been already prophetically uttered by the prophet Isaiah. And you find that this quotation is found six times in the New Testament. Matthew 13, 14, Mark 4, 12, Luke 8, 10, John 12, 40, Romans 1, 18. And three of those times, even Jesus himself used it to describe to us the hardness of man's heart through the parable of the sower found in the Synoptic Gospels where Jesus explained why he spoke in parables to conceal the truth from the scoffers but to reveal the truth to the seekers. The main idea of these verses is that if people close up their hearts to God's word through his servants, because God is going to do the work through his servants, the Lord will confirm their rejection by hardening them even further. As I matured in the faith, more so preaching the gospel of God's righteousness, I realized this reality that when we are administering the gospel, we find that anybody closes up their heart to the word of righteousness. God himself will confirm their rejection by further hardening them. Because the next time when I speak to them, it becomes even more difficult. I used to wonder why. But now I know. I can conclude that their hearts are not open to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. God's purpose is to be glorified to the preaching of the gospel to all people. God accomplishes that purpose through His servants who are willing and obedient to the Great Commission. Another aspect in point two, the mission. This mission is simply the proclamation of the gospel of God's righteousness that constitutes Jesus' baptism, death and resurrection, which is the Great Commission. The hardness of heart prevents sinners from responding in faith to the gospel truth, but it never thwarts God's ultimate purpose. The mission of God will be fulfilled according to His perfect will. I just wanted to share you a secret. Sinners are always responsible for their stubbornness and unbelief. But if they turn in repentance and faith to the Lord, it is not their doing, but only because God has granted it to them. There are so many scriptures to back up this. Only God can grant us repentance. Unless the Father draws, none of us can come to Jesus. It's further validated in Acts 11 verse 18. In other words, we are solely responsible for our unbelief, but if we come to faith in God's righteousness, it is solely from God so that none of us can boast before Him. Today, in our church at NCCKL, if you are saved by grace through faith to the gospel of God's righteousness, it's not because of your doing what you did or what you did not do, but it's because of God's grace of drawing you and granting you repentance that you may believe the gospel of God's righteousness. So nothing for us to boast, nothing for us to brag. The reason why we should always remain humble and preach the gospel to the lost souls. 
we find that Israel was cut off because of unbelief. And the Gentiles were grafted in, according to Paul in the book of Romans. God has not rejected his people. One day Israel will again be grafted in. And Paul explains it in the book of Romans in chapter 11, verse 25 to 26. That partial hardening had happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile have come in. But after that, God has promised that all Israel will be saved. But meantime, like Paul, we the elects should commit ourselves fully to God's purposes to fulfill the great commission. Whatever the hardship, we should commit ourselves to get the gospel of God's righteousness to all who have not yet heard. I thank God that through the online ministry, God is showing us some great things that He's going to do through our lives. The cutting age, the recording team, we are being so well trained over the weeks that we can take this gospel to the world. And I can see that this gospel is going to reach the world to the endeavors of NCCKL. That all of us have got a role to play. I know that you can't come to church and help us or stay at home and help us, but yet I know your faithfulness to always be attentive to all the messages being preached, faithfully responding to the message as well, and your giving simply speaks about of your participation that you want to be part of what God is doing at NCKL. So all of us, we will come back to church and together we will take the Great Commission to the world around us. A scripture from the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 2.10. He says this, Therefore I endured all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Luke never tells us the final outcome of the Apostle Paul's trial, what happened to him, or anything about his subsequent life. Paul probably stayed in custody for about two years until AD 62, during which he wrote Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. It's what we call the prison epistles. While his accusers did not show up, he was most probably released on default. He probably visited again some of the churches. He made his way all the way to Spain, I believe, to Ephesus as well to meet the elders, which he once predicted he will never see them again. I believe he also visited Crete and left Titus there to minister. He sent Timothy to correct some of the doctrinal problems at Ephesus. During these two years, while he was in Rome, I believe he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus. Perhaps he also was betrayed later on by someone such as Alexander the coppersmith and arrested again. He was taken to Rome and was once again imprisoned where he wrote to Timothy, most probably in AD 67 or AD 68. Later on, so much of historical accounts where they claim Nero executed the great apostle who had fought the good fight, finished the race, and kept the faith, which is found in 2 Timothy 4, 7. Let me read it to you. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I have kept the faith. That's Paul's accomplishment. What about us, church? In conclusion, a few things that I want to just highlight to you. What about us at NCC Cal? We are the elects in these last days. I just want to urge you to have these five things going on in your life so that you can also fulfill the Great Commission. Number one, you must have a burden, church. Ask God, for those who are lost. That burden must be in your heart, just like Jesus was very compassionate for the lost and the aimless and the shepherdless. Two, equip yourself, church. I really will urge you, when while this moment, you can't attend church, take time to read the Word of God, pray, meditate, listen to God's Word. The recordings are always there for you. You can keep listening to those. The lifeline is there. The abide is there. So equip yourself, church, because this training will pay off 
so that he can preach the gospel confidently in the days to come. You must have knowledge, church. Strength comes by knowledge so that you can have faith to administer this gospel with accuracy. That you will not be a, a worker who would be ashamed but be able to divide the word correctly. So you need, it's a moment that you can seek God, enhance yourself, inculcate an attitude of growing in the knowledge of God. And then, of course, church, pray. If you can't come to church, you can pray that God will continue to strengthen us to serve His gospel. You can pray, church, your prayers are very powerful. And pray for mission endeavors. Pray for Brother Abakuk, who is leading the mission endeavors in our church. He's a missions director. Have you really prayed for him? Pray for the team, Dr. Sue, Sister Ern, Brother Jeremy. These are the person that God has given us. Pray that God will give them vision so that they can continue to serve us to the mission endeavors that we as a church can rally along with them as well. And finally, church, sacrifice church. Nothing comes easy, church. There's no free lunch, church. We've got to work for it. And our working is simply by faith, laboring with love, by giving your time, your talent, your possession for the cause of the mission in carrying out the Great Commission to the world around us. So church, I brought the book of Acts to an end. I believe that this book has served you and blessed you, that the time has come that we will rise up and do the work of God for the glory of Jesus Christ. Thank you. God bless you. I want you to stand now because I'm going to pray. Father, we want to thank you for the book of Acts. Throughout these two years, Father, you have taught us so much, God. We know it is all deposited in our spirit, man, God. The days will come, Father, even now, God, that we will rise up to the occasion and that we will serve you with such confidence, with such faithfulness and obedience to the Great Commission. Have your way, God, in our lives. Let it be done unto us according to your perfect will. We commit ourselves to you. We thank you and bless you. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask. And all of us will say, Amen.